favorite radio station. This is Afro Vibes Radio Houston. Is there a denial stage, though? Like, when you're kind of like in your 20s, we're blessed, like, as just kind of like a generation. And, you know, we're going to likely live longer than our parents. And maybe. People before, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like, you know, and our grandparents, like, the person that will probably live 120, 130 years has probably already been born. Like, that's what, yeah, I read that in a book somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, we, we are definitely blessed. We don't live in a world of war. We don't. Like, yeah, there's war happening. That's not like in these far off different places. And, yeah, there's bad things happening. But the vast majority of us in, here in America, and this may be just America blinders, like, we, we, we don't have to leave our homes thinking that we're in danger. Like, yeah, there's things that can happen to us, you know, if we get pulled over by the wrong person. Like, you know, things can happen to us. Or, or, you know, we just walk down the wrong alley. Yeah, things can happen to us. Yeah, exactly. The food. I mean, food. I mean, so that's that's the war right there. You know, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I say. It's like we live in a state of kind of like safety. And I think that that can be kind of blinding in some aspects because then, you know, we don't need to have faith. We feel that we don't need to. I mean, obviously, I could just walk around and do what I want. Do you think a part of that is, is probably, I guess, to your point, we're kind of too comfortable? Yeah. I, cause, and, yeah. and I know that this is yeah. going off topic a little bit, but I'll bring it back. Um, I didn't truly embrace things and really shift my way of thinking until after I got laid off from, from my, my previous job mm. because I was too comfortable. I mean, for the most part, I mean, I had money coming in, and I could basically do whatever I wanted, and I was living by myself. So I had all this freedom and everything basically being taken care of. There was no need for personal growth. I mean, I could do it if I really wanted to, but where's the motivation? Yes. And and until I got into a situation where, oh, now I have to try to figure out how am I going to pay rent this month because I don't have any money coming in. That's when things, after things got real, that's when I started changing the person I was and kind of rekindling what was a, a fading relationship with God simply because I was like, all right, I can't do this by myself. Like, I, I need some extra help there. I, I've, I tried my own avenues, but this isn't working, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm drowning right now. So it's like, how do I pick myself back up? Uh, but I feel like well, a lot of people, there has to be some type of dramatic event some trauma to spark that kind of change because yes. people who are too comfortable there's no motivation for that change like for me mm-hmm. it was a life or death situation like i felt like it was fight or flight so i needed to figure something out but if you're not in that fight or flight and where's I, that where's i watched that? the movie earlier man the lost land of z and a quote from the movie said that a man's reach should always exceed his grasp Mm. To keep you going for it, like I, I gotta keep precisely going mm-hmm. for it, mm-hmm. precisely. And like you said, when I'm comfortable, shit. I mean, I got it in my head. I don't know. I need to reach for it for it now. But if it's, it's there, and I gotta keep reaching for it, that's what's keeping me moving. I think even when you look at people that retire, you know, a lot of them when they retire they don't do anything, sit at home, they just, they just deteriorate. You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if I get out and go travel, keep keep. Uh, or go back in, in, to my old hobbies or do that one thing that I always wanted to do that pushes them, you know, a lot further along in life and living. I agree. I agree. You know. I agree. That's a good point. I mean, I think, Devonta, you raise a good point. It's not only, this, from my life experience, not just, you know, life or death situations, but even when great things happen to you. Hmm. And then you take a step back. And then sometimes you realize in life that there are some situations which could have completely gone south, which could have completely gone against you. And your life will be in a completely opposite situation than where you are now. And you had no control over that, but it went your way. And I think that in terms of reaching out to the young crowd, going on to the point that we make, Mm -hmm. I think a lot of preachers when they try to reach out to young adults they don't people need to feel like they have a purpose in anything that they do in life and anything that they follow they need to feel like they matter and i don't think we need to emphasize that we're all created for purpose just like you said Stephen, we're all created to serve and we don't hear that message a lot and i think 
that is what drives some people away when they people when they think they don't know what matter then they just leave Ooh, like if you're in a if you're in a job hurt. and you feel like you don't matter and you feel like you're just going day by day you're gonna leave i mean that, that's nothing's gonna appeal to you if Eventually, you're in a group yes. and you feel like you're not contributing you feel like there's nothing bigger than you that you're reaching for you're going to leave but it's only certain people that have that mindset though that's not true. everybody has that much. Some people sure. work a job and like, oh, I'm satisfied with just this. Yes. That's true. That's true. And, you know, I have no counter argument against that, <laughs> to be yeah, honest. Because, like, it's, yeah, it's, you have to have that, that mindset to go for more. Yeah. You know. But you can, it's possible to, I wouldn't say implant, but just to open the eyes of some people. Very true. Right? Like what we're doing now. Let's say someone can listen to this show and say, wow. They're raising some good points, right? Let me, you know, change my mindset and, you know, follow my calling. I think yeah. another thing, too, you have to reach people where they are. Yeah. Ooh, Even how the, how the story is told in the Bible. How, Jesus, whoever you talk to, just talk to them where they were. Exactly. The fishermen, yeah. taxmen, the, whoever. The prostitute. The church, yeah, the prostitute. The mm-hmm. Talk to you where you at. So, do, uh, okay, so to that point, do you think, that the structure of sermon should change then so like the certain time the certain time slots because you know most churches have like a, a 8 a.m and then they have like 11 a.m uh, 11 a.m and then there's like a 3 p.m service do you think that they should probably change it with age groups where like you have you have a certain sermon tailored in a way that's going to be effective for a certain group and then the next sermon would be the same message but just tailored in a different way to suit that group Meeting people where they know. are, in a way. That's a, that's, a, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good one. Because then, then again, when you do, you have to be general with, all right, we talk to 18 to 25-year-olds to or 18 to 20 to 25-year-olds. I mean, that's – not everybody's going through that same thing at, that, at those ages. You know, you got some people that's successful. You got other people that's like – but this is one thing that I uh, – to this same church again, and – <laughs> Who is this church? <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Like this, <laughs> yeah. it's caused so many problems. <laughs> but this is this is so I, I pay very close attention to, to people's words and even the words that they're not saying, right? Mm. So I, I really hear you, give you space to be to really hear you, right? So exactly. I'm listening to this pastor, and what I gathered is that he was preaching to everybody the same. Yes, that's not a leader. It's, it's not. Right, not everybody in here you know, feels down and just need God. And I'm standing like, oh, man, I'm, I don't need to hear that. I'd like to hear something deeper, you know, break those allegories down for me. You it's know. like, you already got me here. Like, you know, give me something yeah. I can use. Yeah, you know, really, give me something I could use. But it, I don't think a lot of churches would do that. I think a lot of them have the capability to. I think a lot of pastors know this, but... It's just like the pharmaceutical injury in industry. I can't give you the cure. I'm not gonna give you the cure, because then I lose money. Mm. You know, I have to keep you coming back every week. I have to feed you. Yeah, but if you're giving people what like tools that they needed, that would, wouldn't that give more motivation for folks to come? Until He's like, oh, you I reach wonder. your own personal limitation, and I think a lot of these ministers they they don't have like super formal training. Some of these guys are like, you know, they, you know, they, they, you know, they've been doing this since they were like in high school. And then they did kind of an apprenticeship kind of thing at one church. Then they went to another one. They went to another one. Yeah, there's like, you know, certifications that go in there. But it's largely a piece of it is a vouching like kind of like format like who whose church did you go to? And like this is that and the third. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know, so my, my dad, he's, you know, on his way to get in his, you know his ability, his certificate that said he could preach now. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it it, it all, it, a lot of it, a heavy amount of it came from who was your pastor and what did they teach you? And, you know, there was a time for that. There was a time for that when, when black people couldn't go to school, go to seminary. They didn't have time. They didn't have money. Like, they couldn't go to seminary. You, 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 just like with a blacksmith, you went for an apprenticeship and then eventually, through time, you became a master of something. Well, with time, you have to change at some point. Like, yeah, they do still do blacksmith like apprenticeship, but there you still can go to school to learn things. 
Like you still have to continuously be trying to teach yourself things, to try to grasp more of of kind of like the overarching view of quote unquote the plan. But mm-hmm. if you if you stopped in a certain place spiritually, which a, a lot of these pastors it feels like they do, they stop somewhere. They're how can they possibly encourage somebody to keep forever reaching just beyond their grasp? That's so, why I say it's the same. So let, let me kind of so let me ask this question then. Do you would you rather have a preacher who has lived a, an outrageous, a outrageously pious life and really no life experiences, or somebody who's effed up a lot and has you know been married, been divorced, you know was a player for a little bit, you know was broke probably filed for bankruptcy, and now it's preaching. Would you prefer somebody with a checkered past or somebody who... That's cool and all. Like, like, it, like that is huge. That is God literally taking somebody mm-hmm. who screwed up, just like a lot of other people do, and then showing somebody that they can grow. However, I cannot sit here and discount the fact that, that the greatest orator of the faith came from a man who... I hadn't seen nowhere where he did something wrong. True. Jesus. Like, I, you, just, you just can't deny it. But what he did come with was humility. And that's, and that's the key. A somewhat, the big piece of what comes from a pastor who's with a checkered past or a leader who's had a checkered past, they know, they know how it's been. They know how it felt to be there. They know how it felt to be kind of like lost. But someone who's not honest with themselves or honest with others on how they were lost in the, in the beginning then they can't hope to actually like reach them because they even if you know they're living piously they're getting farther just like with age they're getting farther and farther and farther away from the time when they were lost so they're lo- they're losing the capability to reach out to somebody to to speak to someone on their level because they've pushed that that kind of like corrupting kind of like nature away from themselves like with time like it's yeah but that's pretty much it and t- take Kanye for instance. Like, man, like he is a man that needs boundaries. Like he needs he needs a woman there to try to to hey, no, Kanye, take your medicine. Come on, man. <laughs> like, no, because he know you know he needs medicine. Yeah. We we all know he does. He had that with Alexis Pfeiffer. Exactly. And, <laughs> yeah. And that he, he, I like Kanye too, but he, he needs some boundaries. He does. He disappoints he's, me sometimes. He's a genius. He's a man who cannot speak without music being played. Yeah. But when he does speak, you hear him not from his lips, but from his heart. Mm-hmm. So that's 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 why I definitely I definitely respect that. But yeah, that's a. Cool. I think he talks too much. <laughs> and what I mean by that I'm is, I let him finish that. I was like, uh, I'm, I'm telling finish, you, man. I love, I, 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 I love Kanye. I love Kanye too, man. But I think he just, just like, yo, bro, you, you talking too much, meaning you're not listening to everybody else. Yeah. Like, you know, drop your seeds here and there, and then keep moving, like Jay did on this album. Like, but like, you, like my man was saying, like, it's something that we already know. You know what I mean, but uh, you got you got to start a, a little bit back. Give yeah, some backstory. As, as the as the <laughs> as you know, I think the churches have a job to do. Black churches, as a black man up in that pulpit, you, as a black man in America, have a job to do to reach back and build your community. Who are these churches paying their tithes to? The general district. Um, then the district pays to the region, region pays to the national church. And at the national level, that's where, that's where a lot of the programs are being run. Mm-hmm. Like that, like that's how that's supposed to be. But it, I am not a hundred percent sure of how they choose where to kind of enact where, cause they, they are like, you know, keep in mind, they are on the national level. They give to like, you know, overseas missions. They do give money to like food pantries and stuff mm-hmm. like that. It's just, you people don't know. Like they don't tell no, yeah. like it, no one's at the meeting. No one knows anything. Yeah. And yeah. then when you get back, you don't. He, the The pastor's not telling you anything. Like they're just kind of just like, oh, well, I mean, if you wanted to know, you would know and stuff like that. Like it's it. And how can we can't we can't galvanize ourselves from the ground level up when you have like a person for at the very bottom of the quote unquote Jesus pyramid. <laughs> no, but if you have a person at the the believer that's walking the streets, that's there, that's in everyday life. If you don't have this person on board with what the general vision is, what the national vision is, then you do not have a direction. You're just kind of like 
just bunch doing of, your thing. You just doing everybody doing their thing. So I mean, to, so to go back with the, uh, the the church tithing, right? Yes. Okay, now I understand that now, but uh, if you go to a black community, man. There's a thousand churches. Yeah, Ooh, on every lot. corner. Yeah, right. There we go. A lot. But a majority of our communities are, you know, dilapidated. Yes. Yeah. You know, going down. You know, and it's the the, the bottom of the bottom. The and there's no zoning rules, so you got church liquor store, church liquor store, yeah. church liquor store. Hey, and hey, so hey, I'm in commercial you, real estate. The no zoning is a good thing. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so you have a skyscraper next to a Taco Bell, all right? <laughs> it's next to you know a Don's Pizza Hut or whatever. I don't know. So so my point is, I think that the you being that pastor the black church because that is the biggest business and the biggest influence on a black community mm -hmm. you have a job to do to gentrify your own neighborhoods we have to gentrify our own neighborhoods man instead of pe other people coming in with their money and gentrifying it you know we've seen all these the liquor store, if it is a liquor store, it shouldn't be, you know, whoever it is other than us in and, our neighborhoods or and, the corner and, store honest, the and, gas all those, and all those places are owned by Indians, Pakistanis. Exactly. I wasn't even going to say nothing. Vietnamese. I'll, I'll say, say, I'll yeah. say it's a Medina talk. We're real over here. Like, yeah. that, that pisses me off. I went to one church event. It was a, it was a fashion show. And uh, my girlfriend was involved with, with the fashion show and everything. They had vendors off on the side. Uh, where you can go and get jewelry and uh, there's boutiques to get you know custom dresses and things like that. It made sense with the event. My issue was the fact that every single one of those vendors were Vietnamese or some type of Chinese or Hispanic. Not to say that you know I'm against inclusion, but this is a black church. Where are the black business owners? Right. Like we're not invited to any other place. Like you, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're not gonna go to some Buddhist temple and find black people selling shit. So, nah, or even Chinatown. Go over to Chinatown if you want to. Yeah. So this is the only place that we're actually welcome to, and I don't see our representation. How right. fucked up is that? Aren't you guys pointing? To, I mean, you guys are making some good points, but that's a bigger problem within the community. Yeah, as a whole. like that there's is a lot. A there's really a lot of big true. problem. So from what I, you know, from what I've seen, I can't speak. I grew up in the suburbs, right? So it's, I'm not going mm, to, mm, I'm not, mm, <laughs> you know, wow. I'm very that's, thankful that's for that. That's a surprise for you. Know? <laughs> Preacher, hey. son, suburbs, we're learning a lot my, about you, My Bill parents grew up in the village, all right. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I think, what, and Chris Rock, he was, he was talking about this in um, one of his comedy stand-ups, it's, and I know this. I there are plenty, plenty of African American doctors, engineers, yep. lawyers, people who are doing extremely well in these professions. But you don't see these kinds of people doing some outreach in, in the inner city communities. So who are the inner city communities looking up to? Rappers, right? R rappers, basketball players, football players, and that's not that's, that's not always a bad thing, but. It's there are other avenues out there, right? And the history, you know, we know the history of hip hop, and well, hip hop is nowhere near as uh, how do I put this in terms of beefs compared beefs now compared to what it was in the '90s when yeah. you know people were actually yeah. shooting each other up. But I think it's there just needs to be more role models from these other avenues of life besides what we see i mean it's not a bad thing that but they're, they're living to... in the suburbs exactly and it's what i'm saying people aren't they're not making the effort to go back to those communities and reach out to, to people. Out. why would you go back somewhere that rejected you to begin with and you point to another problem. that Exactly. That is a that's a really good point. So, and so and why, you why got a is bunch that? of crabs there? And I don't I don't understand well, why you don't that? have to ask for their permission. It's true. Because here's the thing: we're the person in that situation is generalizing because they're assuming that everybody in that particular group is not going to accept them. There might be that one kid who hates the environment that they're in, and they're trying to figure out a way to get out that's not involving sports. And you could be that spark. That says, you know what? Let me do into let me go into commercial real estate. That guy was really cool. 
I want to be like him. Like there, there's always an individual in a group that's going that that thinks differently. You know, not not everybody. A contrarian. Yes. Yeah, I'm a contrarian. I was that kid. Mm-hmm. You know, and so yeah, you know, it, it, it's it's interesting, and and I get that person, but I think it's a cop out. Like if you if you can do better, you should. Like you have a responsibility. And the, the biggest problem that I see in the black community is the fact that the folks who are well off are not doing enough. And I'm mm-hmm. not talking about Beyonce and Jay-Z and all those folks. They're already doing community outreach. LeBron James is basically, he's, mil- he's, he's lifting up Akron yeah. by himself. <laughs> yeah. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the middle class folks. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about because people Because they like, go out. Yeah. You're, you're detached from it now, so I don't see it anymore because I done moved to, you know, the other side of town where the grass is greener. I don't see it. I don't see it anymore. It's a toxic family structure that they're they're running away from. Because the first person, first people you would even help or you would even be around is those you related to, and we all have those family Literally. members yeah. who will drain you dry, Literally. and they Get will be like, these- just because they deserve it. Because yeah. they deserve it. They, you know, they gave you a dollar one time when you were I like, babysat you, know, you for three hours. Exactly. <laughs> that one time. I changed your dirty diapers. <laughs> it's like, you know, knowing full well that they, they probably didn't treat you very well when you were young. And, you know, it's only now that they can see what they could get out of you that they look at you or they even pay attention to you or they even listen to you. They barely do that. What's the, the- root of this? That's Ooh. a cultural issue. Vision. A lot of us don't have vision. Mm. I, so I've been cutting hair for 16 years, right? I have four brothers, man. They were my clients starting out. The guys in the neighborhood. Wait, wait, wait. Seriously? Yeah. yeah, he cut my hair. Yeah. Let me get hey, you <laughs> Yo, the ad fine. <laughs> 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 this weekend, I need to get a cut. So. Uh, yes, I got, I got let's you. Let's so, and, and this is, you know, this is how we, we met. And we had, you know, majority of this talk at the shop, yep. mm-hmm. you know. But uh, vision, man, I've been saying this for a while. So um, it took for me meeting a guy who had a very successful business over here on this side of town, like off of uh, West Timer in Richmond, mm-hmm. uh, West Timer in Fountain View, uh, Richmond in Fountain View, uh, for me to come out here and start cutting his hair and come to the shop to see, you know, type of cars that he would drive, like that woke me up. But before that, I was like, all right, I'll just build a shop in the hood and that'll be it. You know, I'll just, I have a few of them in the hood. And I always had that, that um, uh, I always wanted to be, I always, I always wanted to have a chain of barbershops, but I just wanted them in the hood. Um, but when I met him, it just took me to a, a, my vision expanded. Yes. You know, and now I'm back at the point where, you know what, I, I do want to come back to the hood, take what I've seen. I came, I saw a country, but let me take what I learned. Let me t- I want to take it back to the hood and build up. Because I think the barbershops, man, are like churches. You know, they're the, it's the black man's country club. You get a lot of game from the barbershop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know a lot of it's a lot of talk going on in the barbershop. Mm-hmm. You can learn a lot of that from it's the many different sense. walks of life. You know, um, so I like to take that back to the to the neighborhoods, man, and um, clean the image up of the black barbershop. You know, but also do things in the community to give back, clean up the community, buy property here and there, rent it out or whatever, build homes, mm-hmm. rent it out, make a little complex. Duplex or whatever, but I, to, to go back to the churches though, I don't know I'm hopping around, but no, no, I think so. that's what the churches should do: buy those properties up, invest in the other black businesses in your community, in your congregation, mm-hmm. and, and keep that dollar turning. Because mm-hmm. our our dollar doesn't circulate enough, man. We don't yeah. own any mm-hmm. too much of anything in our economic yeah. structure in, in America. Mm-hmm. And that, a part of that, and this, I don't want to go into a huge long history lesson here, but what's really unfortunate is the fact that after desegregation, uh, we started to see a lot of our businesses and real estate disappearing, Mm -hmm. mainly because of ourselves. It wasn't because of some outside source. A lot of us thought that, okay, now since we're able to go into these different places, it's better if I work at this place and I live in these neighborhoods versus where I'm at right now because I don't Mm -hmm. value what I have right now. Houston looked completely different 50, 60 years ago. 
if you guys actually go to the African American History Museum, mm-hmm. uh, you there's billions there's and billions of books. There's an African history. Wait, yeah. the one in D.C. No, here in Houston. The third Ward, like here in Houston. Yeah. It's next to downtown. Yeah, I'm gonna learn museum something. Museum district. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be real with you. I okay. haven't been to the museum. Check district. it out. Oh, okay. you know, I went okay. to a play. I went to the Lion King. That's about that's, it. That's, that's not. African-American that's not what I'm history. talking about. A good friend of mine does his roundtable uh, discussions there. Oh, really? really? Yeah. That's good. Yeah, I'd be willing to check that out. But yeah, I mean, it, they showed you like we had hospitals, schools. We we had some really good people coming out of third ward, going to prestigious colleges, Ivory League schools. Uh, and then obviously, what happened is people started moving out of the neighborhoods. People started going to where the suburbs were, and 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 kind of being with the white folks in a way. And then all the white people did was but like, they're all fun. Right. <laughs> I'll just be real with you. You know, when you get past, you know, the situational casual, you know, racism, they're pretty fun. <laughs> the they know how to they casual. know how to have a good time sometimes. My boy told me one day he's like, man, they don't fuck with you like you think they do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, like, I think majority of that is that that glass jaw mindset. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They put us in that glass jaw when they bombed the 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 buildings uh Black Wall Street. Don't even get me started on that. That that I was putting us in a jar and the putting a glass lid on us. At work, I told somebody that. And they were like, what? What are you talking about? And I'm mm-hmm. like, look it up. <laughs> they don't fuck with you like you think they do. <laughs> <laughs> I if you did, you would know about it. You would want to be, hey, how can I help you build yours back up? That's what I like to hear from them. Show me that. How can you help me build mine back up if you really do care about us? We can't use Black Wall Street as a reason not to trust them, but we can't sit there and like point it out and just like, well, you know, you guys just never got it together, you know? You know, you've been free all this time. It's your you never great did anything. Fault. And that's, that's, that's a false narrative. <laughs> no, I'm saying, and a lot of them, and I had to correct somebody the other day, and I'm like, seriously, I told them, look up Black Wall Street and then come talk to me. And then come talk to me about what happened there yeah. and why it happened. Because, you can't tell me it was like, oh, uh, you know, uh. I mean, nineteen twenties, we had things popping, yeah. and you, and that's not that far from slavery. Yeah, no, it's we were not. able to do amazing things. Houston, going back to Houston. All right, you know, you guys are familiar with Emancipation Park, right? Yeah. All right, do you guys know? <laughs> you should say the Emancipation Proclamation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, vaguely uh, recognize not, the not topic. <laughs> but do you guys realize it was a small group of slaves that saved up enough money to buy that land? And that was out of like 10 years or so after slavery. Like, we were hustlers. Yeah. We've always been hustlers. Yeah. Still waiting on my 20 acres and a mule. Build it. We built our own. Go buy it. We had it. <laughs> Go buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Go buy it. <laughs> and call it that, too, 20 acres. I don't have a mule yet. It's man, Spike acres. Lee is the most spiteful person. <laughs> 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 hey, man, I can't be mad at him, but I'm just like, dang, Spike, man, you ain't got to be like that. Like, he took all that anger and built a business out of it. I was like, dang. That's what we should be doing, but like I, fear, man. Yeah. Fear for a lot of us. A lot of people always ask me, "Oh man, how did you start your business?" You know, of course, because they they see from the outside and they perceive me as like as very successful in their eyes. Perceive they don't me go, as I like that car. Ooh, yeah, yeah they, you they know, see the, they don't see the process. But yeah, they don't see the process. They really don't see exactly where I'm at with it. Like I'm really building right now. Mm-hmm. You know, I have to like tear things down and like start over. Uh, but. You know, from a lot of people, like, man, I want to do it, but I'm just scared. Like, what if I fail? Like, dude, fuck that. Yeah, yeah. Fail. That's what you need. You mm-hmm. need you need a you long list of failures. Yeah. Then you know dude, what to do just, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's true. Just jump out there. And do it. You this look at a bird, man. Nothing but failures, man. <laughs> <laughs> you look at a bird, man. The man, bird didn't take know. off walking. The baby didn't take off walking. I mean, the bird didn't take off flying. Yeah. It fell a few times, you know. Yeah. You know, not too. Then long. it got it together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think some of that though is. Um, some people have the mindset of our failures tend to hurt a little bit more. Yes. And so we have to be a little bit more mindful and we Ego, take man. educated risks. Should be preparation. Ego people don't point. see failure yes. in the right way. Yeah. That's another yeah, that's a that's a part I mean, of it too. It's perception, like people are scared to and, look. And it's tough because we're the school system. They say, All right, you fail this cl- what happens when you fail a class? Go back. You you get held back. If you fail a test, you might fail that class. It, and it's the way that it's so indoctrinated that people are now afraid to take risks. Yeah. I mean, and, that's what the school system and, is for, though, to keep you into a box. This is the glass. The school system is the glass jar. Yeah. It's supposed it's like to train you. It's a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, yeah, you know, it's, 
I, I hear I hear what people are saying about like the school is just programming you, blah 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 blah. It's not teaching you to build on your talents, but it it is supposed to be trying to the the purpose of it is to try to find the truly gifted. Yada yada. That's yada, not the yada. purpose of our public school system. I'm telling you, man. Yes, no, it the, is. the purpose of, the purpose of our public school system was to get more educated folks to serve the workforce. Like back in back in the yes, industrial you're era. You are right. You are right. But now, but now but now we work so actively hard and teachers work so act, like so hard to try to find that student. That one student who's probably going to get to go to Harvard, this is that and the third. And there's so much focus on those particular students the looking for the exceptional that they that they lose out on actually bringing that average person and making them as functional as possible. And that's why I say that there's like a shift away from making someone actually ready to kind of exist and more along the lines of kind of like, you know, building a mound for someone to stand on top of. Mm. Well, that's another problem you highlight. We've highlighted lots of problems today, but let's get <laughs> solutions. All right. That's, all right. All, all right. right. So we got to do one on that. Then. We're good, though, Trent. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll probably have that as a little short. All right. Yeah, I'll probably just put that as a little teaser. Shorter sermons. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised we didn't go into that, honestly, to be honest with you. Yeah. What an organ I. Yeah, dude. I appreciate y'all being here today, man. man. That's no problem. problem. Appreciate the invite, man. Sure. I love you. But if you guys want us to do this topic again, please leave comments and emails. You know, say some stuff on Instagram, whatever it is, and we'll we'll revisit this. But we talked about a lot of stuff. We talked about tithing. We talked about just the structure of churches. We talked about, you know, are they doing their jobs in the community? I mean, we just touched on a lot of different aspects, and obviously this, this conversation going on and on and on. So the conversation doesn't end with us. It just begins with us, and, and it ends with you guys. So you, I want to know what you guys think. I want to know, you know what you took from this conversation. As always, like us on social media. And so Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, we're there. Uh, send me emails. Hopefully not too bad. <laughs> a whole bunch of bad ones. Um, <laughs> i got to be real with y'all. I don't listen to those, so whatever. <laughs> but uh, this is Vanilla Talk. I'll see you guys next week.